Good morning, everyone. It is good to have you with us this morning for what is going to be our last and final morning in the book of First Samuel. We are at the end of our series in this wonderful book. And so turn in your Bibles to the last chapter of First Samuel, and that would be chapter 31. This morning, as we come to the end of this book, we come not only to the end of the book, but also to the end of Saul's reign. And not only to the end of Saul's reign, but also his life. You will recall that in chapter 28, Saul, he had a final conversation with Samuel. And Samuel prophesied to Saul that he and his sons would die on the field of battle. These are the words of Samuel to Saul. The Lord has done what he predicted through me. The Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hands and given it to one of your neighbors, to David. Because you did not obey the Lord or carry out his fierce wrath against the Amalekites, the Lord has done this to you today. The Lord will deliver both Israel and you into the hands of the Philistines, and tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. The Lord will also give the army of Israel into the hands of the Philistines. What we are going to see here in chapter 31 this morning, it is the fulfillment of that prophecy. So we are going to read the chapter together from verse 1 on through to verse 13. Before we do that, let's bow and have a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you so much for this time that we have been able to spend in this wonderful book. And as, uh, as we come to a close in 1 Samuel this morning, we just pray, as we have prayed before, that your Spirit, your Holy Spirit, would enlighten us. May your Holy Spirit guide us, teach us, lead us into truth. Have your way in our hearts here this morning. May we walk away different than, we, than how we came in. Speak to us during this time, we pray. Amen. Verse 1 to verse 13. Now the Philistines fought against Israel. The Israelites fled before them, and many fell de dead on Mount Gilboa. The Philistines were in hot pursuit of Saul and his sons, and they killed his sons Jonathan, Abinadad, and Malkishua. The fighting grew fierce around Saul, and when the archers overtook him, they wounded him critically. Saul said to his armor-bearer, Draw your sword and run me through, or these uncircumcised fellows will come and run me through and abuse me. But his armor-bearer was terrified and would not do it. So Saul took his own sword and fell on it. When the armor-bearer saw that Saul was dead, he too fell on his sword and died with him. So Saul and his three sons and his armor-bearer and all his men died together that same day. When the Israelites along the valley and those across the Jordan saw, saw the Israelite army had fled and that Saul and his sons had died, they abandoned their towns and fled. And the Philistines came and occupied them. The next day when the Philistines came to strip the dead, they found Saul and his three sons fallen on Mount Gilboa. They cut off his head and stripped off his armor, and they sent messengers throughout the land of the Philistines to proclaim the news in the temple of their idols and among their people. They put his armor in the temple of the Ashtoreth and fastened his body to the wall of Bethshan. When the people of Jabesh-Gilead heard what the Philistines had done to Saul, all their valiant men marched through the night to Bethshan. They took down the bodies of Saul and his sons from the wall of Bethshan and went to Jabesh, where they burned them. Then they took their bones and buried them under a tamarisk tree at Jabesh, and they fasted seven days. This is the story of how Saul, the first king of Israel, died. He went into battle with his sons, with the army of Israel, and while they were in the battle, they realized that the battle was not going well. And the men, realizing they were in deep trouble, they began to flee. And it was while they were fleeing from the Philistines that Saul's sons, including Jonathan, 
they were killed. While he was alive, Jonathan, he was a loyal friend to David. He was a loyal friend like the kind of friend that we would like to have. The kind of friend that any person would be blessed to have. The kind of friend we ought to be to those around us. He was the kind of friend you could trust with your life. He was also a man of courage and faith. I think of that incident from chapter 14, you might remember it, where Jonathan and his armor bearer, they attacked a Philistine outpost. It was just the two of them. But they attacked a Philistine outpost. And the reason they did so was because Jonathan, he was a man of incredible faith in God. This is what he said. He said, nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. And with such strong faith in God, he and his armor bearer, they attacked that Philistine outpost, and the Lord gave them great victory. Sadly now, that man of loyalty, of faith, the man of courage, he has been slain on the field of battle. The narrator, however, is not quite so much concerned about the death of Jonathan or his two brothers as much as he is concerned about the death of Saul. That is the focus of the narrative here. At first, Saul, he is wounded by the archers. Then, realizing all was lost, that death was imminent, he requested that his armor bearer kill him. The first half of verse 4 reads, Saul said to his armor bearer, draw your sword and run me through, or these uncircumcised fellows will come and run me through and abuse me. It would seem here that Saul is concerned about the fact that he is going to be captured by the Philistines, he's going to be taken alive, and he is going to be tortured by them. And he didn't want that to happen. Uh, kind of like how in World War II, uh, you didn't want to be taken captive by the Japanese. They were not known for being very nice to their prisoners. The same is here uh, with regard to the Philistines. The Philistines, they were not known for being very kind uh, to their prisoners. Years earlier, when they captured Samson, you'll remember they gouged out his eyes they put him to work grinding uh, grain in the, in the mill, and then they paraded him before all the Philistine people and before their god, Dagon. This is rather humiliating for Samson, the Israelite champion. That's what he was, a man whose strength was second to none. But here he is now being shown off like a trophy. There's no dignity in that. Saul is thinking to himself here, I don't want that to happen to me. Remember that this is a man who's very much concerned about preserving his honor, his reputation. Back in chapter 15 of 1 Samuel, uh, he went to Carmel to build a monument in honor to himself. And after the Lord had rejected him as king, the, he said to the prophet Samuel, just come honor me before the men, before the elders of Israel. Saul, he's very much concerned about his appearance. And for the Philistines to parade him around like they did to Samson, that would be utterly humiliating. Saul, he didn't want that to happen. However, just as David refused to take Saul's life, Saul's armor bearer does the same. He too refuses to take Saul's life. And so Saul, in an act of suicide, he falls on his own sword. The king of Israel is now dead. And upon his death, the rest of the army fled. The battle had been lost. The story does not end there, though. The next day, the Philistines, they came to strip the bodies of whatever valuables 
they could find, whatever armor was there that they could take home. And they find Saul and his three sons. You might recall back in chapter 17, when David kills Goliath with the sling and the stone, he then goes and takes Saul, uh, he then goes and takes Goliath's sword and he cuts off Goliath's head. Same thing happens here. The Philistines, they stumble upon the bodies of Saul and his, and, and his sons, and they cut off their heads. And then they hang up their bodies like trophies on a wall. But their bodies didn't stay hung up for very long, because somehow word got back to the people of Jabesh Gilead. You might remember the people of Jabesh Gilead from chapter 11. Just after Saul had been anointed king of Israel, the people of Jabesh Gilead found themselves in trouble. The king of the Ammonites, Nahash, he was attacking Jabesh Gilead. And the people of Jabesh Gilead, they realized they were, uh, they were in trouble and they wanted to make a treaty with Nahash. And Nahash was okay with making a treaty with them under the condition that he could gouge out the right eye of every person of Jabesh Gilead. The people of Jabesh Gilead, they responded by saying, give us seven days. If no one comes to rescue us, then you can do with us whatever you want. And Nahash, for whatever reason, he agreed to that. Saul came and rescued the people of Jabesh Gilead. He got together the men of Israel and they went and fought against the Ammonites, slaughtering them. He saved the people of Jabesh Gilead. And now, all these years later, those people, they had not forgotten that kindness that Saul had once shown them, and they returned that kindness. Although Saul is dead, just as Saul had gone and rescued them years before, they now go rescue him. Even though he is dead, they take down his body, the body of his sons. They bring them back. They burn them. And then they bury the bones. Two things we're going to look at here this morning. Two points for you. Point number one, we are going to consider the king who failed. The king who failed. I think back to how it all began when the people of Israel requested a king. 1 Samuel 8, verse 19 to 20. But the people refused to listen to Samuel. We want a king over us. Then we will be like all the other nations with a king to lead us and to go out before us and fight our battles. We could read this verse in isolation from the context of the rest of the chapter. And if we were to do that, we could very well ask the question, well, what is so wrong with this request? It seems like a harmless request to have a king. It seems perfectly reasonable to have a king to lead you into, to lead you into battle. This was not a harmless request, though. They were rejecting God as their king. And the Lord, he said as much. In verse 7... He said, they have rejected me as their king. In asking for a king, the people of Israel, they were making the decision to put their trust in a human being to bring them victory in battle instead of putting their trust in the Lord to bring them victory in battle. But after we have read now the events of chapter 31... We almost feel like going into the Israelite territory and asking them, so how did that work out for you? You asked for a king who would lead you into battle, who would deliver you. How did that go for you? How did it turn out? Didn't turn out well. Didn't turn out well at all. 
Psalm 146, verse 3 to 5. The psalmist writes, Do not put your trust in princes and human beings who cannot save. When their spirit departs, they return to the ground. On that very day, their plans come to nothing. Blessed are those whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God. Don't put your trust in princes, in human beings who cannot save. That was what the people of Israel did. They put their trust in a king to deliver them. Again, in asking for a king, the people of Israel were making the decision to put their trust in a human being to bring them victory in battle instead of putting their trust in the Lord to bring them victory in battle. And it failed miserably. Saul, he couldn't save the people of Israel from the Philistines. In fact, forget about saving the people of Israel from the Philistines. He couldn't even save his own sons from the Philistines. And not only his sons, but he couldn't even save himself from the Philistines. In verse 9, in chapter 31 here, we learn that the Philistines, when they found Saul, they stripped off his armor. Saul was wearing armor, obviously, to protect himself. Back in chapter 17, when David was going to go into battle against Goliath, you'll remember Saul wanted him to put on armor, and he dressed him up in armor, obviously to protect David. Saul thought that this armor is going to do David good. Well, we can see for Saul here, his armor didn't do him any good. Moral of the story is that if God isn't looking out for you, you can be wearing all the armor you want, but you're on your own. And that's a, that is an incredibly dangerous place to be. We can learn many lessons from the life of Saul. Many things we could take away. But one lesson we can learn from the nation of Israel and their decision to ask for a leader like Saul is to trust, trust in the Lord to keep you safe. To walk you through every trial, to see you through every hardship. Find your safety and your security in Him. Not in anything else. Not in anyone else. Jeremiah 17, verses 5 to 8. This is what the Lord says. Cursed is the one who trusts in man, who draws strength from mere flesh, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. That person will be like a bush in the wastelands. They will not see prosperity when it comes. They will dwell in the parched places of the desert, in a salt land where no one lives. But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in Him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its troops by the stream, that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. The people of Israel, they put their trust in Saul, and Saul failed. We put our trust ultimately in the Lord. He will never fail. Point number two. We have considered the king who failed. Saul failed miserably. But point number two, the king who was to come. The king who was to come. If you go through the book of 1 Samuel, you see leadership mess after leadership mess. Bad leadership from start to finish. At the beginning, we were introduced to the priest Eli. And Eli had two sons. They were unruly, wicked individuals. And Eli, he failed to restrain them. According to 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 29, 
he honored his sons more than the Lord. And the Lord judged him severely for that. After Eli died, we go on to the next leader, who was Samuel. He would seem to be a leader who served the Lord faithfully. In fact, we might even be able to say that out of all the leaders that we see in the book of First, in the book of First Samuel here, Samuel was the better of them all. He seemed to judge Israel well, but he wasn't perfect. While he led the nation well, it would seem that he didn't lead his own family well. His sons weren't really any better than Eli's sons. The book of Proverbs, it says to train up your child in the way they should go, and when they're older, they will not depart from it. Uh, Samuel doesn't seem that he did this. His sons, who he appointed as leaders, they didn't follow the Lord as Samuel did. Chapter 8 and verse 3 reads, But his sons did not follow his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain and accepted bribes and perverted justice. These are the leaders of Israel here. And like Eli and his sons, they left much to be desired as far as good leadership was concerned. Up next to bat would be King Saul. And we've seen his track record over the past, uh, over the past few months. He tried murdering David. Uh, he tried murdering his own son, Jonathan. Uh, he succeeded in murdering all the priests of the Lord at the city of Nob. And he was a man who did not have his heart set on obeying the Lord. He disobeyed the Lord time after time. Again, he left much to be desired as far as godly leadership was concerned. The book of 1 Samuel, it is a book of failed leadership. Fortunately, with the death of Saul, David was ushered in as king. And David was, of course, a much better king than Saul. There's a reason the Lord chose David. Acts 13, verse 22, these are the words of Paul. After removing Saul, he made David their king. God testified concerning him, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. We don't read about David's kingship in the book of 1 Samuel. David becomes king at the beginning of 2 Samuel. But even David in 2 Samuel, he makes his mistakes too. He's not a perfect king. And he leaves, some, uh, he leaves much to be desired as well. Though not as much as Saul left to be desired as far as godly leadership was concerned. Israel was in need of of good leadership. They were in need of the ideal king. And it is in this way that the book of 1 Samuel, it points us towards the king who would eventually come on to the scene, the ideal king, Jesus Christ himself. Jesus, he was a prophet, he was priest, and he was king. There are Many places we could turn to that indicate he was a king. I think, though, of the visit that Mary received from the angel Gabriel when she was told that you're going to have a son. This is what the angel says to her. This is uh, Luke chapter 1, verse 30 to 33. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. You might notice in there the usage of kingship terminology. The text says, The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom 
will never end. Throne, he will reign, his kingdom. Clearly t referring to Jesus as a king. He was the ideal king. But what made him the ideal king? And as we conclude here, I want to highlight a couple of the differences between the first king of Israel and the ideal king of Israel, Jesus. There are, are many differences between Saul and Jesus, of course. I'm going to give you four of them here. Jesus, he was pleasing to the Father. It's a big difference between Jesus and Saul here. Jesus was pleasing to the Father. Luke 3, verse 21 to 22. This is at Jesus' baptism. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Now there is a big difference there between Jesus and between Saul. Jesus was pleasing to the Father. Saul was not pleasing to the Lord at all. And it was for that reason that the Lord rejected him. I think of chapter 15 after Saul was told to destroy the Amalekites, all the Amalekites, and he did not do that. This is verse 26 from that chapter. But Samuel said to him, you have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you as king over Israel. Saul was rejected as king because he was not pleasing to the Lord. On the other hand, you have Jesus, and the Father says of him, says of him you are my son, whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. So that is the first thing, is that Jesus was pleasing to the Father. Secondly, Jesus' heart was set on obedience. His heart was set on obedience. I think there is no example greater than when he is in the Garden of Gethsemane and he is about to go to the cross and he knows what's going to happen. And he says, Father, not my will, but your will be done. He wanted, to, he wanted to be obedient to the will of the Father. Matthew 26, 39 records that moment. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet, not as I will, but as you will. He wanted to be in the center of the Father's will. In contrast to that, you have Saul, who was not concerned about doing the will of the Lord. Again, we go back to chapter 15 of 1 Samuel, verse 9. But Saul and the army spared Agag and the best of the sheep and cattle, the fat calves and lambs and everything that was good. These they were unwilling to destroy completely, but everything that was despised and weak, they totally destroyed. This action on behalf of Saul was in disobedience to the command of the Lord. He was told to destroy everything, the good, the bad, all of it. Saul he didn't do it, and in not doing it, he demonstrated that his heart was not set on obeying the Lord. As Jesus' heart was set on obeying the Father. There's a difference there between Jesus and Saul. Thirdly, Jesus was perfect. Hebrews 4 verse 15 reads, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Jesus was absolutely perfect. And it goes without saying that Saul was not perfect. The man was far from perfect. There's a reason the Lord rejected him. There's a reason that the Lord wasn't pleased with him. Fourthly, and most importantly, Jesus saved us. In chapter 31 here, Saul, he is unable to save himself. He's unable to save his sons. He's unable to save the people of Israel from the Philistines. Jesus Christ, though, 
the ideal king. He came and he saved us from our enemy. Saul couldn't save the Israelites from their enemy. Jesus Christ, he came and he saved us from our enemy. Sin and death. The Apostle Paul says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. In Christ Jesus, our Lord. This is the good news of the gospel, friends. The good news of the gospel. Because of our sin, we were destined for judgment. We were destined for damnation. But Jesus Christ, he came to earth 2,000 years ago, lived a sinless life, died on the cross, took our sin upon himself, paid the penalty, defeated death by rising from the grave. And if we put our faith and trust in him, we will never experience death. Eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Jesus came to deliver us to save us from that death, from that enemy, which we could not save ourselves from. That is the good news of the gospel. That is our ideal king. He is our king. He is our savior. And one day, we look forward to the day when we will get to be with him for all eternity. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for our time in 1 Samuel. And as we recognize the mistake of the Israelites in putting their trust in someone other than you, may we take warning. May we always, first and foremost, Put our faith in you, trusting you to deliver us, trusting you to take care of us. We thank you that as your children, you do that. Give us, give us the faith, give us the trust, Lord, that is unshakable, that when the storms of life are swirling around us, our anchor holds. Our trust and faith is not shaken. We thank you, Lord, for 2,000 years ago when you came to earth. We thank you for the sacrifice that you made. We thank you for the penalty that was paid on our behalf. We thank you that you took our sin upon yourself. We thank you for the hope that we have that one day we will be with you, our Savior, our Lord, our King. We pray this in your name.